chance uh, to do this. Okay, so uh, uh, let me let me do the, the the advert for the friends for a start. Who are, who are we and what do we do? So the Friends of Fakehachi Strand Preserve State Park is a mouthful. Um, so uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the state system, a citizen support organization or CSO uh, in Florida is, is, is a uh, not-for-profit recognized by the state and the role and mission is to support the park and the park management. Um, so this particular CSO was founded um, as a uh, not-for-profit organization in 1998 and has been active uh, ever since. Um, so the sort of activities then that we do to support the park, there's a couple of categories here. Um, raising funds to support activities and, and what, does, what do we do with the money? All sorts of different things go on. Uh, infrastructure in terms of we're currently helping to erect a pole barn to put the park vehicles in the dry in the summer and so on. In the past we've funded uh, controlled burns in the park that are done by helicopter. These are th items that are not in the regular budget of the park and the manager needs to move quick as I'm sure you know with controlled burns. Windows of opportunity uh, uh, sometimes few and far between and they nearly need to move on it. So uh, we will uh, consider the request for the funds uh, at a moment's notice, if you will. Um, and in order to do this fundraising, then there's several things that we can do. Uh, the friends conduct tram tours, uh, guided swamp walks. If you want to get wet and get in the swamp and see what it's really like. Um, at full moon uh, in the season, uh, we'll conduct uh, a moon tram tours where you take a ride, see a bit of the park, and then watch the uh, full moon come up uh, over the park. It's uh, quite delightful when the weather is perfect for it. Uh, there's a park gift shop and we hold fundraisers as well. Aside from the financial side, we also provide physical and material support to the park in, in many ways. And I've listed uh, three of them here. Uh, we have volunteers who come over from the East Coast in normal times every week and spend the weekend clearing brush on the trails. Uh, volunteers in the summer literally build roads uh, to make, keep them maintained. Um, and we also spearhead efforts uh, to try to improve visitor facilities and uh, provide education in keeping with the preserved nature of the park. What that means is, so a, uh, let me give you a quick um, background on the name then. Uh, a preserved state park in Florida, as opposed to a recreational state park, is the, the nearest equivalent organizationally to a national park. So the preserve is the most the highest level of preservation uh, that you can get in the state park. So. There's no ice cream stands and swimming pools and so on uh, in the park, unlike a recreational one. So we have to you know, maintain the, uh, the, what we do within the character of the park. Um, so orchidswamp.org is our website. Uh, please feel free, go have a look. There's all sorts of information on there. It's uh, very, well, uh, very well informed. So here's a, just to give you an idea in, in photos uh, in the upper left corner here then we have a group of swamp hikers who all came out alive uh, over to the right here's someone who cleans brush all the time uh, Dennis Giardina down here is the, uh, an orchid expert who gives us time and benefit of his knowledge and then over here is Glenn Stasel the gentleman in the blue shirt is the president of the friends and myself conducting a, a trolley tour through the park so this gives to give you a taste of what we do. Um, as you all know, um, South Florida is special in many ways in terms of the uh, fauna and flora that it supports. And it has a very distinct tropical, sub, subtropical climate distinct from the rest of Florida. And uh, sometimes I hear this referred to as the northernmost island of the Caribbean 
which of course is uh, geographically incorrect, but botanically perhaps more so. The red circle is this is where the Fakir Hattie is. And uh, so uh, you may know what a Köppen climate map is, but you can see from this that in, in terms of climatic categorization, it's a little different to the surrounding area. Um, and why is that? So we'll get to in just a minute. So just a, a little bit of a geographic, uh, give you your bearings. Uh, the Fakahatchee is the largest state park in Florida. There are 175 roughly properties uh, in the state park system. The Fakahatchee, uh, although there are that many, the Fakahatchee alone comprises around 10% of the total park system of Florida. Uh, it's currently around 85,000 acres or 130 square miles. Uh, so at the north end, uh, here's I-75 Alligator Alley. Um, the red star is exit 80 from there. Uh, in total length, the park is about 25 miles. At the very bottom down here, it's uh, down on the 10,000 islands in Fakahatchee Bay and it's about five miles across. And the, the altitude uh, up here is about 15 feet above sea level. And at the bottom, of course, we're at sea level. So you're going down in the north to south, uh, 15 feet in 25 miles or about seven inches per mile, uh, which is flatter than the gradient of Kansas on average. Uh, so any of you who have ever driven from Kansas City to Denver will know how exciting that is. So uh, flatter than Kansas isn't a great advert for the park, but that's not why people come here, of course. It's the largest strand swamp in the world. So uh, a strand swamp is a linear swamp, usually um, running a certain distance. This is the longest. Roughly speaking then, where this line here is, which is a, a tram or trail, uh, is roughly the middle of the central slough. So this is where a lot of the water comes down and then spreads out in the southern part of the park. Um, it is, uh, I said, a, a special place in many ways. Uh, it's a refuge for all sorts of tropical and subtropical plants. I'm, I'm not going to read them, um, as well as several mammals. Um, in terms of what's going on at the moment, just in case you are tempted to visit, I'd like to draw your attention to two areas. One is this red circle, which highlights what's called the Big Cypress Bend Boardwalk. And I'm going to talk uh, quite a lot more about that area in the course of the talk. Um, that's distinct in terms of entry to the park from the blue circle, which is where the park headquarters is located. And I mention this just because the number of times I have been up in this region of the park and someone pulls over and says, so where's this boardwalk then? And I hate to tell them they've got a 15 mile drive all the way around here to get there. So uh, in normal times, if you're looking for the boardwalk, if you happen to have not been there before, you want to be on US 41 or the Tamiami Trail. We'll come back to that. In terms of what's open at the moment, the boardwalk is closed. Um, it's too narrow to allow for what is currently deemed uh, socially of, of appropriate social distancing. And so this remains closed. There's a gate and it's locked. Uh, the park itself is open during daylight hours. And there are numerous trails in here uh, that one can, can, can hike uh, as you wish. Uh, but the boardwalk itself remains closed. If you keep an eye on the, if you're interested in that, keep an eye on the park website and the Facebook page, and that will most likely be the part that gets updated first. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, as I've said, it's a unique habitat. Part of this is because this uh, limestone valley um, down the center of the park is full of many uh, hundreds or thousands of years of organic muck and it remains moist uh, all the time it very very rarely I've, I've only ever seen it once look totally dry and even then if you walk on the mud you sort of go into it so 
Uh, it keeps the moisture under the canopy all the time. And the canopy, of course, restricts the solar radiation coming to the floor, uh, as well as breaking up the wind. And so this mitigates both uh, the extremes of high and low and allows plants to survive under the canopy that would probably not survive without it. Um, and so it, it's uh, good for uh, providing habitat for these. But of course, like in a lot of the rest of Florida, uh, invaders love it as well. And both the, the animal and plant exotics are a major challenge in the park. Uh, Brazilian pepper, you, you all know very well. Uh, the bromelid weevil uh, lays it, its larvae in the, the heart of the, the giant airport, and air plants, excuse me, the Talanzas. Uh And uh, so there's a bit of a, a story to that. Uh, just to, for those of you who are really, uh, as I say, I'm no expert on this. Uh, if you really want to know what plants are in there, what animals are in there, this link uh, is a link to what's called the unit management plan. So every park in Florida has a unit management plan, uh, which is a document that uh, describes what the park management proposed to do for a following 10 year period. So this was originally published 2014. And so it's about a halfway through. I put this link in because uh, within it, there's more information than almost anybody would ever really want to know. Uh, there is a, a, an imperiled species inventory. So in, in Florida speak, imperiled is anything that's considered either threatened or endangered, and it falls under this title. And there are 71 plants and 44 animal species recorded within the boundaries that are considered to be imperiled. There's also a broader list of just every plant that's been, and animal that's been documented in there as well. So. Uh, hold the question when it comes to, is this found in the park? Uh, because most of them are not gonna know. Uh, and this is a, a documentation of that that will give you far more accurate information. Okay, so imperiled species. Uh, let's talk about a couple of them. The link here is uh, to an article written by Mike Owen, who is the park biologist, uh, who's the gentleman standing in the left picture holding some air plants. Uh, Mike has been the park biologist at Fakahatchee for over 20 years, and he only has two or three years left until he says he's going to retire. We'll see if that's One or two happens. now. Yes. Hello. Okay. Um, and so Mike is a, a wonderful source of uh, all things biological in the Fakahatchee, and uh, get to meet him if you haven't, and you, you can. So this uh, part was the uh, this uh, bromelid weevil. Um, and what happened was they, the, the plants that were surviving, something like 94% of all the plants that he has documented in there uh, died as a result of this uh, infestation where the, the grub of the weevil eats the heart of the plant. And as uh, I'm sure uh, you all know, these plants only bloom once in their lifetime. So um, this, this team on the right, you'll recognize some of the characters in there, I'm sure. Uh, it's a mixture of scientists from uh, the Naples Botanical Garden uh, and, and also uh, coming down from, from Saraf, Sarasota, excuse me, uh, at uh, Shelby. Uh, and so all these plants went to those two institutions, uh, had a pesticide bath, and um, the ones that survived after a period of time, <clears throat> they've been put back into the, uh, into the park uh, in the locations where they came from originally. Um, in addition, the, the plants that, that flowered uh, in, while they were uh, in uh, uh, isolation, if you will, um, the seeds were collected and using a, uh, a leaf blower the seed was blown up into the trees uh, around the swamp to try to uh, uh, distribute the plants. Um, and the other thing then in this article that Mike's written uh, is about the efforts of, of him, his collaborators who came from uh, the Botanical Gardens in uh, Atlanta, 
and also some of the, the volunteers from the Friends uh, to try to save the cow horn orchid. And that article that's linked has a, a long description of the steps that they went through to, uh, to uh, try to uh, save the plant. And the short story is there's more cow horn orchids documented in the Fakahatchee now uh, than uh, when um, they started. So that's a good. The picture in the upper left, as you can see, it's an old picture when uh, I'm going to call it poaching uh, of orchids from the swamp was going on way back when, um, although it legally, of course, it wasn't considered poaching at the time. But even in the days of the horse and buggies, uh, taking orchids out of the swamp for, for sale uh, is by no means a new uh, activity. Uh, now, I mention this because um, one of the things that the Fakahatchee is most widely known for are the ghost orchids, and a lot of attention among uh, lay people came about uh, because of this book on the left, The Orchid Thief, uh, which documents um, many things to do with orchids, but in particular, uh, the stealing of orchids from the Fakahatchee and uh, what happened. Uh, Mike Owen has a, a, a feature role in there, so people are always excited to meet Mike. Uh, it was also used as the basis of a movie called Adaptation that came out four years later, which is absolutely nothing like the book. So if you're gonna pick one, I would recommend see the, uh, excuse me, read the book first. And then if you're looking for light entertainment, uh, go to Adaptation. Um, a lot of people, of course, who are far less knowledgeable than this audience uh, show up at the Fakahatchee and, and go, well, where's the ghost orchids? Um, and uh, as you know, they only bloom for a brief period of time. They're way out in the swamp. You have to wade and dodge the water moccasins and alligators and so on. Uh, and so they are there. This was a survey that I was privileged to be a part of uh, last summer. Um, and uh, there they are blooming, you know, they are there. Um, but because of the history of poaching, um, these are not included on guided tours uh, these days. Um, and honestly, uh, as uh, the, the um, Botanical Garden in Naples has done a really quite a good job of um, uh, using uh, cultivated plants uh, in the, the walk in the back. Uh, if you just want to see a ghost orchid flower, check in with the garden and go there. It's far less uh, buggy and uh, swampy to do that. Uh, but it's undeniable that when you come across one of these flowers uh, in, in the swamp, it's uh, quite a beautiful thing to see. Um, these are not the, uh, the so-called super orchids that you'll see out of corkscrew, uh, but that plant, is, I'm sure you've all seen it, uh, it's quite high up in the tree and uh, you can only really see it uh, through the viewing scope or the grown binoculars, whereas these are right in front of you. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a thing to see. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the park. I, I enjoy history and I, I think that the history of how this park came to be uh, is a, this is a very uh, superficial view of it. Um, but the, the, the first sort of place where it's recorded is it um, about a hundred years ago, this lumber company called the Lee Tidewater Cypress Company bought it and did absolutely nothing with it for a long time. The reason that they did nothing with it is that while there were lots of cypress trees in, in this property, uh, harvesting pine is much easier it grows in far drier terrains. Uh, they're easier to cut down and so on. And so it sat there. And then in 1922, it's an interesting historical footnote. But Henry Ford, as you may recall, if you've been out to the Ford and Edison estates uh, in Fort Myers, uh, was a regular visitor for a few years uh, down here. And he was uh, taken by this property and offered to actually purchase it uh, and donate it to the state, and the state declined uh, for a number of, supposedly for a number of reasons, and you believe what you will. Um, 
there was no forestry uh, division in the state at the time and uh, you know, trees weren't thought of as a preservation uh, issue at the time they were thought out as a profit issue and so there was no mechanism for the state to make a profit and the other thing that was very common in Florida then and, and probably still is is that the, the state desired to see the property remain on the state tax rolls um, whereas if they took it into ownership then uh, they would lose that revenue um, so uh, these days we look back at this perhaps as a missed opportunity um, but had the state bought it it probably would have been logged anyway and what happened was uh, as the pines started to uh, disappear uh, and with the uh, oncoming of World War II cypress wood came into high demand because uh, it's very resistant to fire and very rot resistant and very much therefore in demand for things like the decks of aircraft carriers uh, and anything that uh, one wanted to be uh, immune to flame uh, and uh, water uh, and so a lot of this uh, uh, trees were logged out during World War II when World War II came to an end, the logging didn't stop. They just kept going. Um, now, uh, the, the bottom two are parenthetic. This, this is to put this into context. Uh, from 1947 to roughly 1980 is what I think of as the if you will, uh, golden age of uh, preservation uh, in South Florida. Uh, so 1947 then, uh, was the uh, actual uh, dedication of Everglades National Park. Uh, and then in 1954, the National Audubon Society uh, saved or bought what is today Corkscrew Swamp um, as, as the, really the last large uh, untapped or unlogged uh, Cyprus uh, area in, in the state. Um, so I, I, I give you this because I wanted to show you a couple of pictures here. Of, this is the Fakahatchee in 1947, or what became the Fakahatchee. And so the picture on the left-hand side, you can see this uh, large uh, trolley, if you will, that's on a railroad track. It's placing the, the wood onto this track. And these were what they, they referred to as trams at the time and an entire network of trams were, were built uh, to facilitate this. And um, those trams remain basically the bed of many of the hiking trails uh, in there today because the trams were built with the uh, fill, uh, dredge and fill approach where dirt is taken from one side or both piled up so that the tracks don't flood and uh, you end up with a canal, if you will, either side of the train tracks. So um, some of those remain, and those are where the, you will find the hiking trails today. Now in the Fakahatchee, the, the rather intimidating to me uh, saw on the, the right-hand side, uh, there was no lumber mill in South Florida large enough to cut up cypress trees. And so the, the, the uh, trunks all went on trains all the way to a town called Perry, which is in the panhandle of Florida, because this was the only place in Florida where the mill was large enough to chop up cypress trees. And you can see the uh, rather intimidating saw here that was used for it. So logging then continued until almost all the trees were gone. And uh, this is where, um, it isn't the Fakahatchee Park at the time, but it's sort of what became the embryo of the park. So this is um, the, the couple on the left, uh, Delora and Lester Norris, um, are perhaps well known around Naples, but in my opinion, not as well known as perhaps they should be. Um, their daughter, Laverne, uh, married a man by the name of Gaynor, and this is her, at I believe her 90th birthday in Naples in 2015. Uh, this family uh, are, well, are still, have always been uh, very affluent, 
but also tremendously generous with their money. Um, so if you ever wondered how um, Del Nor Wiggins Park got its name, Del Nor, uh, they paid for it. Uh, Naples Pier blew down in the hurricane of 1960. They paid to rebuild it. There was a discussion at the time as to whether or not it was worth spending the money to rebuild it. Uh, and Mrs. Gaynor has continued that philanthropy uh, in the fields of education, uh, particularly around Naples for many years, and has continued to support the Friends of Fakahatchee as well. So the reason I, I, I bring them up then is that this, this I'm not going to read it, but this is taken from a uh, document, uh, a, a celebratory book that the Nature Conservancy uh, put out. Uh, because the, the Norrises uh, were also founder members of, of the Conservancy. Um, and the point here is that the last corner of the native strand uh, was still standing uh, in 1957, and the sheriff of the county uh, told Lester Norris, supposedly, that uh, it was about to get logged, uh, and Mr. Norris then bought the land to preserve it and ended up ultimately giving this land to the state. And uh, you know, the number $67,000 uh, is far more of an, an impressive number when you uh, account for inflation and figure out that in 2020 dollars, uh, or what were 2020 dollars at the beginning of the year anyway, uh, it was in the region of $600,000. So this, uh, piece of property, it's one square mile, 640 acres, and this became ultimately what was the anchor uh, to the beginning of the Strand uh, Preserve Park. And um, this is where the boardwalk is today. Uh, now before the, the park, again, this uh, piece of property that uh, the Norris family preserved uh, was declared a, a registered natural landmark. The uh, plaque that you see memorializing it. Uh, I, on the right, I have put the words up there so one can actually read them. So this is October of 1966. And this is the only the second property so recognized in the state of Florida. Um, and with uh, Corkscrew Swamp being the first so recognized. Uh, these are pictures from the dedication ceremony. Um, on the left, we have the uh, Norris is arriving or leaving for the event. I'm not quite sure. Uh, here's the ceremony uh, of the declaration and a plaque awarded to Mr. Norris who's here. Um, this gentleman became ultimately the Secretary of the Interior in, in Washington. And this guy in the back, this tall, slender gentleman who was very quietly in the background, which was sort of his, uh, his way, is a man by the name of Melvin Finn. Uh, who we'll get to in a moment, who was just a, a, a giant, if you will, in preservation in Florida in the 60s. Uh, the pictures on the, on the right are from, interesting from a botanical point of view. So this picture, the upper picture, was also taken this day in 1966. And this strangler figure is still sort of an iconic uh, piece on the boardwalk today. And the lower picture is one that I took in January of this year, showing the same tree. Uh, so, uh, if you ask how long does a strangler fig live, well, given uh, good circumstances, then uh, at least uh, at least 60 or 70 years. Uh, it's still there if you if the boardwalk opens and you take a walk, you can go see it. Um, so, what what's special? Why you know, why do we think this is so special? Uh, the pictures I'm showing you here were all taken on the same day. So. As you know, when people are giving uh, presentations like this, uh, there's always a temptation to show you all the highlights, uh, which you're you know, really lucky to see once in a lifetime. Uh, these were all taken on the same day. Uh, so we have uh, you know, palms and cypress, uh, uh, pardon me, royal palms and cypress in the same place. Uh, there's only one area of the world where you can see both of those. It represents a border between the more temperate woods in the north this is the southern limit of the cypresses uh, and the northern limit of the, the uh, royal palms in their native form. So it's a true border. 
Uh, there's an there's a alligator hole in the back and the alligator's just hanging out. Uh, there's a tree that if you're there at, at dusk or in the morning, you might be lucky enough to see uh, owls and certainly woodpeckers. Um, there's an anhinga just hanging out by the water. And here's a, 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 a excuse me, a, um, Encyclia tempensis florida, something orchid. I'm sorry, I forget. Um, it will come back to butterfly orchid. Thank you. All right. So this is all there all the time. You take a walk, take a stroll, take some time. Uh, it's a wonderful spot. The boardwalk is a total of about a mile there and back. It's a, it's a there and back walk. Uh, quite wonderful on a, on a nice day. Um, to finish the history then, so Melvin Finn, the gentleman I pointed out, uh, was a, a, a lawyer from Miami, uh, was an orchid lover, and he founded what was at the time the Florida Nature Conservancy, and assisted locally by a lady, uh, Mrs. Jane Parks, they began a campaign to save the Fakahatchee. Um, unfortunately, perhaps at the time, remember the trees have all been logged out, uh, other than the big cypress uh, section. So um, the land gets bought by a land development company. These are the inf infamous Rosen brothers uh, who also developed Cape Coral. Uh, and they began to drain the swamp to develop property. And the port of the islands, which you have probably driven through on 41, was originally built as a sales center to sell swamp land to uh, investors. Um, there's a lot of stuff in between. The short story is by 72, Gulf American were agreeing with the state to relinquish land uh, in the Fakahatchee to the state to settle <clears throat> some fairly significant legal issues that they had run into. I remember in 1974, the first land was purchased uh, for the, the formal acquisition for what today is the Fakahatchee State Park. And land purchases still continue to this day. There's a certain number of inholdings and uh, bordering properties uh, that uh, the state buys when they become available and when they feel the price is right. Um, so the park is still growing slowly. Uh, quick pictures from this 60s efforts. Um, just uh, and to me, the significant thing about this is while it didn't. <coughs> Pardon me. While it didn't stop purchasing of the land by uh, building companies, it made a deep impact on the political environment at the time in Florida. So on the left hand side, uh, this is a petition rolled up that uh, Mrs. Parks uh, had people sign an address. And she did this through, she was uh, the, with the Naples Junior Women's Club. And she had junior women's clubs all over Florida uh, doing petitions to save the fact of Hatchie. And so this, this scroll you see on the left, if one unwinds it, it's about 176 feet long. And it's just signatures and addresses of Floridians who were signing for this. Uh, the picture on the right is, uh, this was a sort of publicity thing, if you will. Uh, this is the uh, Sheriff Hendry, who was the, the sheriff of Collier County at the time. And Mrs. Parks flying over the Fakahatchee to see what was there. And the picture in the middle there, Mrs. Parks is the lady sitting on the hood of the Jeep uh, with some of her recruits from the Junior Women's Club off to uh, go out to the Fakahatchee and see what's there and campaign to save it. So remarkable lady. She still lives uh, in Naples. She moved here with her husband in the mid 50s when the population of the city of Naples was under 2,000 people. So she has all sorts of fun stories. A wonderful lady and worked extremely hard for this. Um, I've got a little video then I'm going to show you. Um, this is uh, footage shot from webcams in the park over a period of uh, two or three months. Um, and this is then a consolidation uh, of of these, and uh, I'll, it's about three minutes long, and I'll come back when uh, when we're done.
Andrew, are you seeing the video on your end? I am. Are you seeing it or not? I am not. I'm seeing a black okay. screen. Okay. Um, let me collapse it down. So can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay. So let me try and open this. Move this window away. Okay. Maybe what I have to do is to collapse my slides. Just one moment, please. Okay, let's try that again. Can you see it now? I'm still seeing your slides. Okay. Um, when you share your screen on Zoom, sometimes yeah. you can select which um, okay. so program let me, you want to share. Okay. So if I go into, uh, um, let me try a new share. Okay, so here we go. Let's try this. Any better? It looks like we're seeing the beginning of the video. Good. All right. Then I'm going to play the whole thing and then I'll try and get the slides back up. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for pointing it out. Uh, apologies. It's a, it's a learning experience here. So let's see if I can make this uh, full size while we're in here. There. Okay, let's try that then. Yeah, so this is a, a, a trail cam <clears throat> that uh, was uh, licensed to be installed in the park. And this is uh, edited from about four weeks of video, I believe. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing in the video clip? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yes. So uh, you, you've seen the, the, the Panthers. Um, uh, let, let me just back it up. I'll, I'll, so this is just a possum. Uh, here's a, a small rodent of some sort looking for uh, his or her dinner. M many of these animals, uh, of course, are nocturnal naturally. Um, and so you wouldn't see a lot of these during the day. Um, so here's the uh, iconic panther, if you will, on, on the prowl. Uh, panthers, uh, if you look at uh, where people have measured them, there's a lot of them in there because they like the trails. Uh, so this, I believe, is Nan Hinga, uh, who's caught a fish uh, out of this uh, slough. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, the, the water that runs. On, this is, so the north is on your left. So the water is gradually moving from left to right. Uh, there's a lot of fish, some exotic, some native in there, uh, but there's lots of them. Uh, here's the panther going back the other way. Probably sniffing at the anhinger, I don't know. So the, the, there's one other animal that isn't in this video. There's an Everglades mink, which is rarely seen. They are seen in the park, but in certain areas. Um, Florida black bears are not uncommon uh, in the park. Uh, like all of these mammals, they, they tend to be shy and retiring. So this is where these uh, trail cams are, uh, give us an insight that we uh, wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, this one is fairly self-evident, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, 
here's a night heron. Okay, so if you, if you like that sort of thing, if you just go onto YouTube and um, type in um, the uh, Takahashi uh, trail cams, there's all sorts of. Um, so let's go back to the slides then. So can you see the slides, uh, Andy? Can you see the slides? No, not seeing the slides yet. Right. You well, might need to do the same thing. Yeah, right? okay. Select let's go back there. to. Uh, um, there we go. Okay. Good. Yep. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that people can get permits to, uh, to, to do this work in the park. Uh, it used to be a, a free for all down there, but there were just so many. Uh, trail cams and you know, people hiking will get offended that they'd suddenly be appearing on trail cam footage. So the park has gone to a licensing system and part of the uh, requirement is that the, um, the footage is shared with the park. So it's a, a fun way of seeing all sorts of uh, unexciting and very exciting footage. Um, for the last part, I just wanted to give you a flavor for future developments uh, around the park. And uh, this is to do uh, particularly with the, uh, with the boardwalk. Um, it's been a, a project that the, the, the friends, and much of this went on before I was ever part of the Fakahachi, so there's no credit to me uh, here. Uh, the idea is to expand and improve the facilities at that boardwalk um, to enhance the visitor experience uh, in an educational sense uh, and also to give what, what we hope is an appropriate recognition to uh, the Norris Gaynor family uh, for their role in preserving the boardwalk and subsequent sponsorship of it. Uh, my recognition here goes out to two members in partic particularly among the friends, Tom Mache and Patrick Higgins. Uh, Tom has uh, been a stalwart for many years on this and Patrick is no mean contributor. There's lots of others as well, but these guys have put a lot of uh, sweat and I know, maybe blood, certainly tears into this project. So th you've seen this slide already. I'm just doing this to uh, remind us where the boardwalk is. We're talking about this area about one square mile down here. Um, you all know the botanical garden, so it's about 22 miles from the boardwalk to there. It's about seven miles to here. This is the stoplight where you would go down to Everglades City or up 29 to the interstate and on to the Mockley. And the actual park ent entrance, the main entrance, is about two and a half miles up here. But we're talking about this area down here. Um, so th as I said, the, the, the friends have put a lot of time and effort into the boardwalk area because it's the most highly visited part of the, of the uh, park, among other reasons. The, me the, the visitation uh, is more than one might think. It, it's roughly on a par with the number of people who go to Corkscrew every year. So it's a very highly visited property. Uh, so here's an example of uh, among the things the friends have done down there. Uh, this is a tiki hut that's put up for school groups that are visiting to sit and talk and, and so on. Uh, and this was uh, done through the generous support as well with the Naples Garden Club. Um, and then, you know, you can't use cypress wood for lumber anymore. Uh, and other wood sitting in wet, warm swamp doesn't last terribly long. So every year, some aspects of the boardwalk need renovation and upkeep. And this is a, 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 a perennial, annual uh, project uh, for the friends. And there's a lot of people who, this is what they do in the winter sort of thing. Um, and then here's Hurricane Irma. Um, 
uh, Glenn and Francine Stevens, who's our executive director, and Patrick Higgins are down there the day after the hurricane, checking it out and seeing the not insignificant damage that uh, has been done. And so, of course, this is September. And by the time uh, the season began, this was all back together. It was uh, quite a remarkable effort, I thought. Uh, again, no, no credit to me, but it's an example of uh, what the people do. Okay, so all this then is a prelude uh, to give you a sense then, hopefully, of what's what. So the wording with the blue colored background are existing features. So the road uh, to the left here, this is US 41 or Tamiami Trail, uh, looking to the west, so looking up towards Naples. Um, the boardwalk entrance as it is today is here in the middle. And if you follow it to its end over here, there's an alligator hole. And so that, if you will, is roughly the dimensions of the current boardwalk. This property closer to us, uh, this then is an architect's eye view or a drone view looking over that. This property is all part of the state park. This roadway exists. Uh, it became an isolated piece during a previous straightening of 41. And so the, the, the notion here is, is that this will become a true parking lot, isolated from the main road where the traffic's going by at 60 miles an hour. Um, there'll be a suspended bridge going over to an interpretive pavilion um, there'll actually be real bathrooms uh, in the uh, lot over here, but no, uh, not an insignificant thing. And then this boardwalk then will go through here around this lake, uh, which is known colloquially as Green Heron Lake, uh, all the birds that frequently nest there. And this then will tie into the old boardwalk here. So it'll be a much more extensive trail it will go through more habitats where there's more of the, the prairie type of habitat here, as well as the, uh, the, the cypress trees and, and the, the swamp. So that's the, the, the long-term dream of this. Uh, so here then are architects pictures, ZG pictures of what it's supposed to look like when it's done. So from top left then, there's from the parking lot, there's a bridge going over here to this interpretive center and from there, there'll be a trail going across the prairie, around the lake, and there'll be a shell path that is then going to join up with the existing boardwalk. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, the dream. The, the first stage uh, of that then is that there was a ceremonial groundbreaking ceremony that involved uh, many of the people who have been so instrumental in getting the project this far. Um, the gen tall gentleman in the blue shirt in the middle is Eric Draper. Er Eric is the, the state official in charge uh, of the Florida Park system, and he was kind enough to join us uh, for the ceremony. Uh, Tom Mace, I mentioned, is the gentleman in the greenish shirt here, and Patrick Higgins is the uh, gentleman standing uh, next to Eric, and uh, so all of those people there have had a significant role in this. Um, there is a, if you want to read more about it, learn more about it, um, there is a website there and you can put it in touch with me. Okay, so uh, th thank you all for joining me today and uh, putting up with me uh, using you as a, a, a learning tool. Um, the um, other people that I, I should acknowledge, as I say, I, I'm the, the, the voice here. Um, on our board and membership, there's many people who work very hard for Baka Hachi. Uh, Glenn Stasel is our president. Uh, Glenn has been roaming the swamps of Florida since he moved here as a school teacher in the 1960s. Francine Stevens is the lady who uh, keeps the whole thing on track and does a fabulous job in that. And then the, the, the staff at the park who are the people who really keep running of course. Uh, Steve Hausconnect is the manager, Mike Owen is the biologist, and then Mike Dewey, Steve, Guy and Nicola, the, the, the rangers and the staff who do this. So it, it's a somewhat, uh, uh, to me, sobering observation. 
So you see there the names of six people working at the park. Them, them managing a park that's 100 square miles uh, or 85,000 acres more or less. The state budget for the park, not including their salaries, is around 70 cents an acre. And they have to run a whole park on that. So it's a, a marvelous one for the job that they do. Uh, so there's our website and there's my email if you have any questions, comments, observations afterwards and want to email me then please feel free to do so. You are more than welcome to do that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's me done in terms of presentation. Uh, let's uh, see if we can get to questions here. Thank uh, you so much, Andrew, for giving that presentation. Um, most welcome. Let's give our um, audience a few minutes to type in their questions into the chat if they have any questions. Um, I always think it's a special treat whenever we get to see the automatic trail camera footage from any of our parks, especially somewhere really special like Fakahatchee. It's always mm. fun to see the wildlife. And I really enjoy hearing about the history of the parks in our area, um, you know, going back all the way to the 50s for different um, landmarks and events that happened um, for Fakahatchee and really looking forward to uh, the new facilities for um, visitation that the friends have planned. That's really exciting. Um, and I don't know if you mentioned, um, but on the Friends of Fakahatchee website, there is an opportunity if anybody feels so inclined um, to donate towards the boardwalk expansion project, you are accepting uh, donations toward it, correct? Absolutely, yes. It's a, um, so it's a project, but it's a long time in the making. Uh, part of the, the, the challenge uh, with this type of thing, uh, it's, it's somewhat financial, um, but a permitting, getting permits to put um, walks into wetlands uh, involves, I, I think there are eight government agencies at local, state, and federal level who all have to bless the plans, if you will. Um, and so it's, a, um, it's not a, uh, an exercise for the faint-hearted. Um, <laughs> and so uh, as, uh, as, as time has gone on, of course, costs have risen uh, over time. And so it's one of these things where maybe you think you're getting close to the finish line and suddenly the finish line is another quarter of a mile down the road, you know. And I know some of our um, longer term members are you know, seriously concerned that, that they may not live long enough to see this uh, in, to come to fruition. The good news is that uh, after all of these uh, travails that the, uh, the state have now put out for bid the first phase of this project. Um, it's going to end up done in phases. Nobody, anyone who tells you they know when it will be finished uh, is being economical with the truth. Um, you know, because it's a state project, um, state budgets get revised every year. Uh, different priorities come up. Uh, and obviously with the current uh, a sad situation, uh, uh, things like building a, a boardwalk are not going to get a high priority from the state of Florida, and, and rightly so. Um, but it does mean that uh, the, the, the deadlines and timelines for these things are, are unpredictable. So, so thank you. Yes, anyone who um, uh, feels that they would like to support that uh, project um, would be, uh, contributions would be most welcome. And uh, hopefully uh, soon the boardwalk will reopen and anyone who wishes to go and see uh, why I'm making a, a noise about it, who's not done so before. Uh, I'm sure uh, as uh, plant people, you would enjoy the experience uh, regardless of whether or not you choose to contribute. So uh, thank you all again for your, your time today. And we do have a question for you, Andrew. Okay. The question is, um, although I understand the need for parking as visitation is high, it seems that the new trails, et cetera, 
will fragment important habitat. Have there been discussions of scaling back the project at all? Um, there have been, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the, one of the issues with the parking, uh, if you uh, have been there, you're probably cognizant of this now. The, the existing facility has no formal parking. There's a, an area in front of a pond in front of an Indian village that butts right on to uh, US 41. And people getting out of the cars then, if you're not careful to stay off the road, you, I don't believe anyone's ever been injured or killed there, but it could happen very easily to the unwary. The, um, whereas where the new parking lot uh, is, is uh, provisioned, that is an existing road already. It's a dead end road. And so it's taking a existing uh, feature. So there's no uh, additional uh, environmental damage or change uh, in terms of adding the parking lot. It, it's using what is already blacktop but making it into a proper parking facility. As to the boardwalk it, itself, um, it goes over a marsh. Uh, these things are uh, planned uh, such that it, does, it won't impede the water flow, which uh, is, as you all know, is very important uh, uh, around these sorts of things. Um, so there's no uh, habitat impact in terms of the uh, animals that can live there, the, the, the plants that will grow and so on. So um, the, the ad potential advantage to it, uh, if you will, is that recognizing there's always a compromise with, with this sort of thing. Um, the um, hope on the part of some of us, this is me speaking and not necessarily the park or the friends, um, <clears throat> it's easily accessed both in terms of the highway and also the amount of walking one has to do uh, to access it. It will be ADA friendly, so people who cannot hike will still be able to visit and enjoy. Uh, and it, to some extent, it takes, if you will, <clears throat> pressure off the rest of the park, which is really a preserve and isn't supposed to have hundreds of people driving around it and tromping. So, the hope is, is that it will make enjoyment to the boardwalk more enjoyable, uh, more accessible, uh, while at the same time uh, detracting people from driving 12 miles up a dirt road and going, well, where's this boardwalk? Um, so it, it, I recognize there's a, a compromise there. Um, hopefully it's a, a reasonable one to make. Thank you for that explanation. and. I know the thinking about the new facilities has been, I think you said, 10 years in the making. It's 10 years in the making, yeah. And, and everybody who issues permits for anything has had a say. The, you know, the Army Corps, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Florida, the um, FWC, DEP, Collier County, the Indian tribes. It's uh, everybody who's entitled to a say has had an input. So it's uh, hopefully uh, compromises to everybody's uh, what they perceive as their jobs, functions, desires, needs. Okay. Well, let's pause for a few seconds to see if there's any other questions out there. Okay. I see at least one participant who's taken themselves off mute. So I'm not sure if they would like to ask a question. Well, I was going to ask about the timing, but uh, um, I guess it's cl it's clear now that can't be determined. Are there any parts that can be begun? Is there a, a beginning point that uh, you can? Yeah. Say? So the the uh, to my understanding, and uh, you please recognize that this may be different next week. Um, the current plan is that the area that is the um, where the parking lot will be. Um, I'm not sure we can get the slides back at this point, but um, the part where 
closest to the, the to, to the, the the screen, if you will, where that visitor center would be. The first thing is to get the parking and facilities in that parking lot um, sorted out, designed and built. And while that's not an exciting feature, it, it's a it's a necessary feature. Um, and the my understanding is is that the funding to do that is in the current state budget. Now, state budgets run from June, end of June, excuse me, 1st of July to 30th of June. Uh, uh, and so with all of the inevitable delays, if you will, that have gone on, uh, I believe that the money is uh, hived off to do that first part of this calendar year. Uh, but the upshot of that isn't going to be a facility that's a lot more interesting to me or you or any other member of the public. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a first step. It's, you know, we take 10 years to get to build a parking lot. It's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing how exciting a new parking lot can be, you know. Uh, so we'll see. No, so. Thank you so uh, much for your us. efforts. I think uh, all of us appreciate your, your enormous efforts in this whole no, thank you. No, well, as I say, please, uh, you know, realize I'm just the, just the messenger here. The, the hard work is uh, a group of highly uh, motivated and, and people with a, you know, a broad skill set that bring a lot of different talents to it. So uh, thank, thank you on behalf of the Friends for the recognition. They're a fabulous group of people. And Andrew, I'd like to thank you for being our Zoom guinea pig, if you will, for the Naples semester. <laughs> I think it went oh, very I, well. Uh, good, yeah. thank you. I I'll, I'll, been, I'll know next time to keep the videos and the slides uh, on separate, whatever. But uh, now, now I know. Yeah, we so. got to see everything. Yes, I think so, yes. Great. And I just have a short uh, closing announcement. Um, we do know the date for our next meeting for the Naples chapter. We are planning that it will be another Zoom meeting and it's going to be with Chad Washburn. He is the Vice President of Conservation at Naples Botanical Garden and he was lined up to speak to us back in March for our annual meeting about native plants and stormwater. So he is now scheduled to speak to us on Wednesday, June 3rd. That's uh, two weeks from today, I believe. Uh, so I'll send out a reminder to everybody in our newsletter and that'll be posted on our website as well. And if anybody uh, thinks of any questions moving forward, Andrew has been uh, gracious enough to provide his email um, here on his final slide. And you can also reach out anytime to the Naples chapter at naplesnativeplants at gmail.com.